Welcome back, guys, to the Bear and Scully podcast with me, Sean Scully, and a.k.a. Scully. Oh, man, a.k.a. the Bear. Aiden, the face for radio, behind the scenes. The technical genius, apparently. Technical <laughs> genius. <laughs> and today we're joined with Julian O'Regan. Hey, right, lads, nice to meet you. Good, good. Julian, thanks for coming up. Getting yep. all these boys to come up to what they feel the sticks. I know it's the, the all these boys from Antwerp coming up and you're yeah. just thinking, fuck me, what is wrong with these boys in Antwerp? <laughs> <laughs> you know. I tell you what, when I'm going to the airport, I drive right in horse through it. <laughs> is there any wonder the serious crime units in Antwerp? <laughs> no, yeah. uh, look, listen, thank you very much for coming up. But before we get going, and I do want to say we're going to cover child loss, and, mm-hmm. and it can be very triggering for some of you that are watching. We're going to include a lot of links, but hopefully... Not as much triggering as comforting, and the story that Julian's going to share mm-hmm. with us. Um, it, it's a tra- your tragic loss, but also there's a message in it that, that we're looking to deliver. But before we get into all that, Julian, we're going to find out a wee bit more about you and then about your wee Bobby yeah. and, and we'll move on. So, my name's Julian O'Regan. Um, I'm originally from Antrim. I'm kind of lived a wee bit of a gypsy life, uh, traveling all around the country. Um, started off in Belfast at about age 10. Spent primary school time in Belfast and then moved to Antrim. And that's where I lived most of my life is in Antrim. And I uh, met a lot of friends there, good friends, you know, and still have a lot of friends from Antrim. And uh, then went to school in Balmina. I went to school in Balmina, hated school. Hated it. Just wanted to go play rugby and just wanted to play a PlayStation. That's all I wanted to do. I wanted to become a professional rugby player and that's all I cared about. <clears throat> and then learned the hard way and... Uh, realised that you can't get a good job with no grades because I only left school with one GCSE for flip sake so had to go back and re-educate myself and put my head down and at the, ten- the time I was re-educating myself I came across an apprenticeship and uh, got into the apprenticeship and now I'm working for a well-known company um, across the country it does a lot of work and I uh, basically do IT solutions and things like that so I install like um, voice over data um, phone systems and uh, routers for you know s- uh, or businesses that need you know business routers and uh, while I was doing my apprenticeship and things like that, I had a little girl called Cassie. She's six years old. That was through a previous relationship. Um, and as life went on and obviously things happened, me and that uh, partner of mine broke up and still see Cassie a lot, spend most of my time with Cassie, I can. And then now I'm living in uh, Cully Backwards, Cully Backy, as you know, like, all know it. So, uh, you need to watch I'll now because you know when you go back. <laughs> yeah. Cully Backy. You're giving them bad money as you go back. Oh, the Cully Backy, you might not get it. It took me months and months and months and months to figure out how they talk, I swear. I like, <laughs> and uh, met a girl there, she's amazing. I've uh, been with her now two years, engaged. And on the topic, just you said a second ago, we had a little baby in January 2003, but unfortunately and sadly she passed away in September 2003. And that's through 2023, and that's brought me to here now to talk about what happened and my journey and what I learned and what I watched and what I went through. But for me, there's a good goal at the very end, if you hear me out, but it's a very sad story. There's a lot of gruesome times for anyone who's listening, so if they prepare themselves for that there, but we can get to that there when we get to it, you know. What did you call your wee girl? My wee girl that passed away was called Rue, Rue Violet mm-hmm. O'Regan. And what you and your new partner, how long were you used to get on menus? <clears throat> so that's the that's the fun bit. So we were with each other for about two, three months. I'm in a surprise, a very, very big shock. Like June 2022, we found out. And I was like, fuck. You know, I was like, you know, happy, scared, you know, all the emotions and all. And But we were, we were excited and stuff and all. And I think then from the finding out of the pregnancy we then got to the you know the 12 week mark and we were like you know you know with the safe safe period here you know everything's safe and then about um a couple of days after the 12 week my girlfriend had like a very heavy bleed and we thought to ourselves you know this is a miscarriage so we took it very seriously and went to the hospital and the hospital then straight to the maternity ward and they were like you know did all the checks did everything they could and and, and did all the tests and everything was good you know the baby's heartbeat heartbeat was fine and everything was good and safe but at that period in those tests they found that my um girlfriend had rhesus d which is rhesus disease so maybe you know what it is or if you just don't know um basically what happens is that if you have a father i have old positive blood and my girlfriend had old negative blood when the baby is then in the placenta or growing it carries the father's uh genes or blood as well which is old positive and then the mother's blood is negative so the mother's bo- body then thinks that this is a foreign object so it's going to try and then kill off the baby and kill off the placenta so it sends antibodies to try and attack the baby and the way they get around that you've maybe heard this as well there's an injection called anti d and the injection that's what the mother has to get then combat that issue 
So throughout our time then, when we were going for our consultations and stuff for my partner's um, problem, we went to a consultation one time and um, she asked for a scan, just a random scan. She says, oh, you know, there's scan equipment here, can I have a random scan? And the doctor was like, um, yeah, no, I was grand. So I was doing the, you know, the, the hard stuff, sitting outside in the waiting room, drinking a cup of coffee, just waiting, you know, the way we have it hard. Uh, <laughs> and my girlfriend called me in and she's like, you know, Julian, I've asked to see a scan here, you know, can you come in? And I was like, yeah, no worries. So the first doctor took the scan and he saw like an abnormality in the, in, in the images. And he, you know, told my girlfriend and I'd be a very, very, very positive person. I would try and stay positive no matter what. That's my attitude towards everyone. And I was trying to tell her, you know, don't worry about it. Everything's okay. It's probably just her lying on her side, you know, her elbows up, her hands up, maybe whatever it is. And uh, the doctor said, I'm going to get a second opinion. So I'm going to send you up to the other hospital here. And uh, we were like, okay. So we're worrying, got up. Second doctor could confirm what the first doctor had said, that there was something wrong in the images. And then they said we need to go see a specialist here. So the specialist can look at it and confirm what it is and let you know what it is. So we went up to the specialist on the next day, which was thankful because we thought we are going to have to wait a week, you know, but we got there the next day, which was very good. And the um, specialist then in turn around told us that... Um, our condition my child had was called gastroschisis. So it's spelt like gastroaceous. It looks like that there, but it's called gastroschisis. And what that means is there's like a, an, a there's an opening in the tummy wall where the child's organs then present themselves outside the body. So the organs grow outside the child's body, but nine times out of ten, it's meant to be quite safe. But I kind of sat there and thought to myself, the first thing I thought was, you know, you're worried, you know, you're, you're kind of thinking, what is this going to be or what's going to happen? So I asked the consultant and was like, um, <clears throat> is there potential that this child can, uh, you know, damage the organs? And this is something that for me, as I was talking to you before we started, was that it's, a, it's about raising awareness. And for me that I feel that not in a bad way. I know that um, people are trained in the narrative to be positive with you. You know, the doctors are trained in the narrative to keep you positive and keep you on a good path, which is right. I don't disagree with that in any way. But I feel as patients, sometimes we hear the positive and we focus on the positive and we don't actually ask enough questions, you know, questions, sorry. So me back then, when I look at my journey, I think to myself, fuck, I should have asked more questions. I should have asked, can this happen? Can that happen? This happen? You know, and try and get as much details as I can. And that was something that I should have done the whole way through my journey, which is what I'll talk about. Um, so he'd said his answer was no, not necessarily. And for me, because I'm a very positive person, I took that as, you know, that's a good answer. I'm, I'm going to focus on that. And that was his narrative of me. And I then said to my girlfriend, you know, that's the narrative that we're going to take. That's what we're going to focus on. But she was obviously, you know, worrying about the condition and stuff. Um, so fast forward then to um, 31 weeks. We got the 31 weeks. And uh, the, the mother was saying, you know, I don't feel too good. You know, um, Rue doesn't feel like she's moving. And again, me being Mr. Positive, I was like, don't worry about it. She's probably just chilling in the womb, eating some crisp or something, just chilling, watching TV, you know. And she was still concerned. And uh, I said, you know, don't be concerned. Just, you know, just play it out a wee bit and see how you are. But she had, she was the right, she, she, she made the right call. So she went to the hospital then. I think it was early hours the next morning. And I was with my other wee daughter, Cassie. <clears throat> so I was playing with Cassie. And I get this phone call and she says, my friend's brought me to the hospital. Can you come up? You know, there's, you know, there's something wrong. I was like, right, okay, that'll do. So we got to the hospital now, and we're on 31 weeks now. And with this condition, gastroschisis, the babies, nine times out of ten again, or sorry, actually all the time, are always premature because they never make it to the full growth because of the condition. And in order to deliver the child, you have to go through the sunroof. You don't go through the front <laughs> door because if you go through the front door, yeah. it can then damage the child more. It can maybe rupture the organs or rupture whatever problem the child has. So we went to the maternity ward and... They did the uh, whole, you know, the sensor where they put it on the woman's stomach and they were finding the, the baby's heart rate. And the baby's heart rate was going up and down really fast. It was like really fast and really low. And that showed that the child was distressed. And then we went then to the specialist. They sent us straight to the specialist. And the specialist was like, you know, have you got work tomorrow, Julian? And I was like, yeah. And they says, right, well, you're not going in. You know, you're going to you're gonna have this baby's coming tonight. And this is where it's quite interesting because there's a lot of interesting things about this story is that um, there's so much equipment that we don't even see or know about. And they put us on this machine, and it had, like, all these, like, algorithms, all these, like, history checks, you know. And it would take your readings, and it would put your readings against that reading. And the machine would then 
you know, tell you, like, this baby needs to come. And that's what they did in our instance. So the baby then um, was then due that same day. She was 31 weeks plus one. So I remember we uh, went into the uh, delivery room. <clears throat> and uh, obviously, if you yourselves have children, maybe cesarean, you've been there, I don't know. But basically, the mother lies down and there's a curtain like that in the head. And you sit down beside the mother and you hold the, you know, obviously your hand and stuff and all. And they're working away and the, the child is being ready to come out. Now, this is, this is probably one of the first things for me, which was quite, you know, as I was saying, gruesome before we started, which was a kind of like a, a gruesome scenario, was that, um, and for anyone that's listening, they kind of just kind of prepare themselves, is that when you meet a child for the first time it's premature, that's quite a, quite a gruesome thing, quite a daunting experience. But to meet your child with their organs hanging out in front of you and blood, that's another thing, you know. So I remember in the whole time I was holding my girlfriend's hand, I was kind of thinking, fuck, you know, this is going to be mad. This is going to be mad what we're going to see here. So they pull the curtain down and they lift the child out. The child's just opening his eyes for the first time. You see the child covered in blood and, you know, intestines hanging out and stuff. And they take the child away and they put her, what's basically the best way of describing it, is like into like a sack. It's like a see-through onesie. And they put it into like a see-through onesie to protect the child straight away. And I remember holding my girlfriend's hand. The nurse came over and she put her hand on my shoulder and she was like, you know, do you want to come and meet your child, and I was thinking, fuck, you know, this is really, really daunting, like, this is really, like, you know, hard to watch, so I went over, and there's a picture on my phone, and um, I held her wee hand, and honestly, her, her wee hand was that small, that it, like, wrapped around the top of my fingertip, that's how small her hand was, and I just, th- I remember looking at the child and thinking, how are you going to survive this, you know, that was that, and for me, in the past there, saying, you know, I'm a positive person, and I kind of thought to myself, how am I, how are you going to survive this, and then I was brought away, and they take the child away straight to the uh, neonatal ICU to prepare for her observations and stuff and all. And then we go away into our room, back to the delivery room. We get ourselves ready, get our night's sleep and stuff and all. And then you wake up in the morning and you go to neonatal. Now, people who work in neonatal, I have the utmost respect, honestly. See see the job that they do, the work they do, the things they see, it's mad. It's like, it's a whole new, I don't know if you've ever been there or, or, or whoever has been listening or, or who may be listening, is that... Um, you know, it's unbelievable. It's like, just like Star Trek, honestly. It's just like all these machines and all these wee babies that are, you know, severely sick and the work they do to help them is unbelievable. So they take the child away and they kind of, the best way of describing it is they put her on her back and they, it's like, it looks like a condom. That's the best way of describing it. It's like a wee tube. And they put the organs inside the tube, the, the, um, the intestines. And they hang the bag at the top of the incubator, so it's like our intestines are in like a tube, and the baby's there, lying on their back. And they do that because then the consultants can come along and check and see what if that you know bit of the boil's bad, or if that bit's good, or if we can keep that bit, or what's going on. So in Rue's condition, what happened was the question I'd asked was, can the organs be damaged? And they said, no, not necessarily. But in our condition, what happened was that my child had been obviously rolling about, you know, moving about, and the intestines had become wrapped and stopped the blood flow. And I remember the doctor saying to us, you know, her intestines were that bad. There was actually gangrene starting on them because she'd been like trying to, you know, shake that feeling off. And that's what the stress was causing. So they straight away the next morning after we had delivered, I remember it was like less than 12 hours. Um, we went into the neonatal unit and it was like mad. I mean, consultants were running around and I remember the woman, the transport doctor come to me. And she was like, um, you know, your your baby's in a really bad condition here. And I remember thinking, you know, fuck me, like, this is mad. Like, we're just literally just going to get birth. It's going all, like, alarm alarm signals are going off here. And I'll never forget this as well. The surgeon had come in and he had, you know, like, the surgeon mask on. And his head, I mean, his forehead was just, just dripping with sweat. And I knew by looking at him that he was stressed out. Like, I knew he was worried, you know, because this was a serious condition. And it honestly looked like he had ran about like 400 metres and come in and sat down beside us and talked to us. And she was, the girlfriend was crying again. I was trying to just stay positive, you know, just say everything's all right, don't worry about it, everything will be okay. So the child then gets taken away for surgery. And this is where, in this in that condition with gastroschisis, if everything's okay, what they do is they just put the organs back into the body. It's kind of like, you know, that game, what do you call that game when you were a kid? The operation. Wee, <laughs> operation. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you put the, you put the parts <laughs> back in. Oh, sorry. And... um. 
that's what they do. They put it back in and then they just sew her up and they leave her in ICU or, or the child in ICU for four weeks. And then they look, keep an eye on the child and the monitor and nine times again out of ten, but it's okay. Um, in our condition then, what happened was that because her intestines had become infected and a gangrene and a blood flow had been cut to the, to the supply, they then had to remove um, a percentage of her small boil and they then had to stitch it up. So because they had removed quite a, a big amount of... Um, small boil it then left her up the stomach but the theory in that is that eventually she will grow and her intestines will grow and the stomach will then be moved back to a full passage you know back to being able to the way we you know we'll turn up so she came back in out of the operation she was successful um now this is the first operation out of five operations and there's one of the operations which my child made history with which i'll talk about later on as well um she then was doing okay for the first four or five days and then all of a sudden she started to fill up with like air. And we're all human. We all fart, you know. So what was happening in her condition was that the air was escaping inside her body instead of coming out of the stomach. So there was a bit that they had left inside hoping that they could save, but it was collapsing inside her. So they tried to, you know, keep it safe. So they had to bring her back then and rush her straight back into the theater and then six days later for a second operation. And I remember the surgeon, this was a different surgeon now, because they work like a rotor, like obviously most jobs do, or surgeon on a Monday night, it'll be a different one on a Wednesday night, whatever way it works. And this guy was like, this guy was cool as fuck. Like he was, he looked like uh, Tony Stark or something from Marvel, you know, he's just like one of those professional guys. And I thought, right, you know, you're giving me more confidence here than the last guy that was sweating, you know. He was very, very good. Um, and he uh, done a good job on my daughter. But the unfortunate thing was then he'd remove more small boil. So then she was... First of all, diagnosed with gastroschisis. And then now she was then diagnosed with what's a condition called short gut. So again, Dr. Google here. I'll try and tell you the best way I can. So for any of us that um, eat food or digest food, what happens is we eat our food and it goes into the stomach. The stomach digests, it breaks it down. And the small intestines start to contract and they start to pull the food away from the stomach. And it brings it into your intestinal tract. Your intestinal tract then takes all the nutrients. So whatever's left over is then waste or poo. So that's how your digestive system works. So in my daughter's condition, what happened was her small intestine was shortened so much that when she would eat, the food would just fly through the small intestine and then go into the large intestine, which meant that she wasn't bringing down nutrients as much as she could. So the way they combat that is they give um, the child TPM, which is called Total Parental Nutrition. And they put it usually in a Proviac line, which is a line that goes into above the heart. And it feeds the child um, uh, you know, uh, nutrients above the blood vessel in the heart, and that's how the child grows while they can't eat. And I'm just going to pause a second. Is there any questions? Because I know I'm flying through this. <laughs> no, you're fine. <laughs> um, it's just see, see, just on the gastro schesis, schesis mm -hmm. right? So the first time I heard of this, and you'd sent through a quick wee bit on it. Um, the first time I heard of it, I was like, Jesus, is this? This is I've never heard of this before. But whenever I went and spoke to my wife about it, she was like, yeah, that, not that it's common, but it, it happens. Apparently it's meant to be like one baby every month, which I, was 12 babies per year. Yeah. Well, I actually went on and it was it was 300 in the UK per year. Mm -hmm. which, Aye, so probably, in the UK, yeah. it's different from here, but it's not like it's a, it's not like it's never been heard of before. Mm -hmm. It is, it, it's something that does happen and it it is operable. You know, yeah. you, you can get an operation just as you're speaking, mm -hmm. but um, I just wanted to, I didn't want to, to skip past that to say this is, this is something that's never happened before. Yeah, it yeah. has happened, and there's been operations that's been successful as mm -hmm. well. That's right, yeah. But just as you're going on through it, there's been so many different things that have went wrong, we'll say. Yeah, yeah. So, again, the, you, that you were saying, Sean, is that that is the case, which they taught, they, they taught us that, you know, in our consultations before the we delivered the child. And they told us that was the, the, the plan was the, obviously they've had that and they've worked with it for so long and they've done so well with it. And that was a narrative that we were given as well by consultations that that was going to happen. And that's the, the positive outset that we had. Um, unfortunately, my child then took a, you know, a, a twist and a turn that was different. Did there, when I hear you talking about it, there's a part of you, there, there's an anger that you had in the full picture that, you know, it wasn't related to you at the time that there's also a possibility that some of the organs can be damaged and that it will require further surgery or mm -hmm. so you weren't fully, but 
one thing I've picked up from you, you're, you're obviously quite intelligent. You've well, quite inte- that's a very insult. You're intelligent. <laughs> you've researched it well. You, you, you're you're well spoken. You, you've you've researched it well. You're the type of person to me that would be reading up as soon as that was told to you. Your way to read up on on you you were weighing up. There would also be when you're online, the worst thing you do is Google yeah, exactly, conditions, yeah. and and they would have discussed this. You you've been positive throughout. What, what way was your partner? And and you know when you say that a woman knows, women know, don't they? Yeah, they, they do. Like they like um, she, she was she was positive a lot. You know she was um coming near to the end, which I'll talk about as well. She was actually still more positive than me near the end. Um, you know she was she had her ups and downs. She was worried. She 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 cried a lot. You know, and it was actually really funny because she cried a lot in the beginning. And I didn't, and then near the end, I couldn't stop crying. <laughs> she was like, you know, you fucking man up, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and um, she was she was positive through it. Set and we both had a positive attitude the whole way through it. And we, you know, kind of kept continuing to, you know, battle that problem together. You know, and 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 one of the positive things from this negative outcome is that. That has made us become so much stronger. Now we found out we were going to have a child, you know, very early on in the relationship, and now we're together now two years later, you know. So it's made it's something that she has in common with me now that I have in common with her. You know, there's there's not many people I know that have lost their you know child, you know, in my yeah. my, my yeah. Age, you know my generation. So um, that was a positive thing for us, which was good and nice, you know, and that helped us come together through that their problem. When you have you you were brought in for the section and you went over and you seen her for the first time she's holding her finger like there's something but like not getting to, to take her it must be so hard for people and their, their child and obviously you're aware of that you know she's going to be two months premature she has th- this condition she's going to require an operation you, you weren't going to what way did that feel for for you your partner i know i'm asking you speaking your partner's behalf what it's hard that you don't get that. Uh, for the woman, yeah, yeah. Um, so she uh, she did struggle with that aspect. The thing was, we weren't allowed to touch the child for um, two weeks after she was born we were, because um, infection control and stuff and all. So the child was an incubator, and um, they're very, very strict in neonatal, so you had to clean your hands thoroughly all the way to your elbows. And then you had then um, have no long sleeves on. So you weren't allowed to touch the child, and our child was... We were allowed to kind of hold her wee hands and stuff, and all, but we weren't allowed to hold her. Yep. or take her out until maybe two, three weeks after. So I think for my partner, that was very hard for her. You know, for me, I think at the time I was just like, you know, infection control. And let's just make sure this child's okay. You know, let's just, let's, let's just um, make sure this child's okay, which then led to the next problem that we had. Um, so after the second uh, operation, we... Um, we're going well. We're cutting down the days. You know, we were worried because we already went through the the first delivery, which was a scary. Then the first operation was scary, and then the second operation they had to rush her again. So that was now three operations this child had had within the space of like two weeks. So then she got brought back into the neonatal, and I remember walking in one day, and I remember going to where she usually sat in the corner, and um, I said, like, "Where's Rue?" They were like, "Oh, Rue's down here." And I said, like, "Why? What's wrong with her?" She was like, "Oh, they've put the three children together in in the ward." And I was like, "Why? What's wrong?" And they were like, they've tested positive for Klebsiella. So Klebsiella, I think it's pronounced pneumonia or pneumonia. It looks like pneumonia at the, the, for the second word, but it's with an E at the end of it. So it sounds like pneumonia to me. I don't really know. Um, it lives on all of us. It's a bacteria that lives actually in our intestines. And it's a bacteria that lives on all of us. But it's like MRSA. If it goes bad, it becomes a superbug. And what had happened was, in our condition, was that the Klebsiella had infected my child's bloodstream. So this meant that she needed to um, be put on a course of antibiotics and there was three very, very strong antibiotics that were used. I can't remember the names of them. But they didn't really know what was the most effective, so they put her on three at once to try and help battle this condition. On top of that there, then, I was sending you about TPN. Because of the condition of the child in the second operation, they couldn't give her the Broviac line. So Rue had to survive for the first eight weeks, or sorry, six weeks in neonatal through lines in her um, hands. And then that would collapse on the other hand. That would collapse or foot would collapse, you know. And the problem with it you have in those situations is that if you keep giving a child a line, if you imagine the needle that we use, I hate injections, like, but can you imagine a needle going into a premature baby? The vein collapses, and when the vein collapses, then the nutrients and the antibiotics can't go into the child, and that causes a problem because the child needs both of those to survive. So um, 
on one of our conditions or sort of one of our times in neonatal and this was another situation that kind of at the time haunted me um was that it's the most i can't really you know describe it you would need to do it you just need to be there to understand it i remember walking to the neonatal and it's like a, it's a hallway and there's two doors at the end you hit the button it opens up you go straight over to the sink and you clean your hands and you do all your safety things and you wear your mask we were still living in COVID rules then and, and even though it was in 2023 we still had COVID rules so had everything all our pp on you know pp on and um I remember hearing this screaming. And I only knew this child now six or seven weeks, you know, sorry, maybe four weeks at this stage. And I could hear this child screaming and screaming and screaming. And I knew myself straight away, naturally, you know, that's Rue. And I'd never heard Rue scream before. It's the most weird, natural instinct that I've ever had in my life. I could just feel, you know, this child screaming. And I remember walking in. And uh, my girlfriend was standing beside the uh, incubator and she looked lost. She was looking at me, you know, like, you know, fuck, you know, this is mad. And what they were doing was the antibiotics that they needed to give, the lines kept collapsing in the child. So they had to keep trying to, you know, get the lines into the child. So the child was just bleeding and bleeding and bleeding and bleeding and screaming and screaming and screaming. And these are the things that I know that they sound like very traumatic and very dramatic as well, is that I'm trying to emphasize everything that my daughter went through so I can teach you what I learned in the end. So it's a very sad and tough story, but in the end there's light, so just bear with me still. So um, eventually they got the line in and stuff and on, and this would go on for a period of three, four weeks maybe. Lines would collapse and then change the lines and then change and change and change and change and change. And change. Until eventually she um, survived the infection and... Uh, she was one of the only three children that survived that infection. The other two passed away. So when we walked in, on your left-hand side, you're seeing families hold their children in front of you. And with like a, you know, the wheelie type of curtains. One of our scenarios, we walked in the neonatal and we're standing, holding hands over the incubator and you're looking to your left and you're seeing the other family holding their child that had the same infection that passed away in front of you. And you're sitting thinking, fuck it, this is going to be us next. You know, that's the thought we had. So we were, um, you know, I was over the moon when she when she got through that. I mean, I was like, you know, it felt like graduation for me. It's like this is amazing, and um, got to the end of uh, neonatal, and we met our consult consultants, you know. And again, this is where I wish I'd asked more questions. A topic I keep talking about. Um, we met our consultant, and I don't hate any of the consultants. I don't have a problem with any consultants because the consultants were my daughter's family. That's the way I look at it, and they did everything they tried to do to you know protect her and look after. Her. And people get it wrong. And that's human. That's, we all get it wrong. No matter what we do. So I, I have my run-ins sometimes with the consultants later on in the end of the story. But um, at the time when we met these consultants, the consultants were telling us, you know, your child's bile will grow. It will get better and bigger. And you will probably be out of here by the end of the year with very little to no TPN. And we were so happy to hear that because we had been through hell. We had been through the first cert, the first delivery and then straight away the surgery for, or the, for like the wee bag. The first operation to remove the gut, sorry, the boil, and then the second operation to remove more, so she was left with a small boil. So we were like thinking, you know, fuck, this is quite a big thing to listen to. So we were more than happy to hear those results and hear those like expectations of our child, and we were told then what ward we were going into. And looking back, the ward that we were going into would be the ward that would be my daughter's family. She never got to go home. She stayed in hospital for the whole time that she was, you know, in her condition. She, that was her family. The, all those health workers that looked after my daughter, that was her family, and they still are. And um, I remember, you know, just eventually going into the ward and thinking to myself, you know, this is mad. Like, you know, when you go into a child's ward and you start to see the older children, you know, you see them suffer, and it's quite a dark thing to see, you know, and it's quite a nasty thing to see. There's two things for me in my life is... Animals and kids. And I see if I see that, that, that there always kind of pulls my horse strings, you know. And um, it's very hard to hear children screaming, you know, for their kids and stuff and, their, and for the mum and stuff and all. And that was a very, very hard thing for us to be in. A very, very dark place to be in. And we were going through our ward, meeting all our expectations, meeting all our, um, you know, goals we were meant to get to. Until one day I went in, I think it was April time, and... Uh, I picked up my daughter and she was smiling away and I was happy enough to kind of see her and stuff, you know, and was spending time with her and all. And um, all of a sudden she literally just vomited up blood, big massive amount of blood. She just vomited up and I was thinking, 
look, that's not right. So straight away to the doctor's table, you know, look, I need a doctor, I need a nurse, you know, come over here and help me. And they come over and they're like, oh, Rue, what's wrong with you? You know, you you acting up and all, you know, playing about, you know. And um, this then continued for a period of about two or three months where her stomach bag would fill up with blood. So, so the blood was like, whatever was going on inside, it was trying to escape. So it was finding any hole it could. It was coming out either, you know, through the mouth or through the stomach. And these bags of blood were filling up or she was having nosebleeds. So we kept saying to the consultants and the doctors and saying, you know, what's going on here? And, and there is multiple amount of tests that went on, um, you know, and then I think due to the amount of problems we were going through with Rue, um, then this is now where we go back to my girlfriend. My girlfriend then took a stroke in April. She's only, now she's young, a lot younger than me. She's 23 and she had taken a stroke at 22 because due to the amount of stress. So during this stage of the child being in the, in, in the, in the ward, my girlfriend was also in another hospital. So I was having to go up to see her in the stroke ward, go up to Belfast and see the child, come home, see the girlfriend, and then go home and go to work because, you know, there was a bit of problems going on in my job and stuff, and I was trying to keep that job going so I could have money to go and travel, to go and see, you know, these right. two at the same time. But my girlfriend, she bounced back very, very quickly and very, very, very good. She she had very she had a major stroke. It wasn't a minor, it was a major. And they think that the stress from the delivery of the child and uh, the... Um, problems with um the child and all and the amount of stress was that it caused the clot to go to her brain but they also found a hole in the heart which is another interesting fact that apparently that hole in the heart a lot of us have it we just don't know about it <laughs> so you know that's quite a quite of a bit of a mad thing to hear um so she uh she kind of bounced back very very well very 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 quickly and the first thing she did was go to the hospital she went straight to the ward to see the child which i thought was admirable you know that was you know amazing to see that and um she then was kind of, we were kind of worried about the situation with the bleeding. So there was a few um, ideas that were stomach ulcers and things from the NG tube, the nastral gazel, or nastral, I can't remember how it's the NG tube that goes through the nose. Mm. We felt like it was like maybe popping ulcers and the ulcers were bleeding and that's what was causing the bleeding. At the time, I didn't really believe it. You know, I not that I didn't believe it, but I was a bit suspect of it. You know, I didn't really think, you know, the amount of blood that was coming out of the child was enough to be an ulcer. That makes sense, you know, you just know you're kind of sitting there thinking like that's not, you know, that's not really, but we'll go with it anyway. So eventually, after a few months, um, the child was always happy, smiling, never cried, you know, that was the best thing about her, like she was bleeding in front of you and she just didn't care, just smiled and that's what I think is, to me, a big massive lesson towards life as well. But eventually, we then got in contact with Birmingham Hospital and they had said, um, you know, um, Birmingham's getting involved they're going to start checking Rue's files and they're going to bring over to Birmingham here maybe we don't know yet but we're going to see if they're going to go so we got a phone call on like the um, I think it was like the 21st of July or something and uh, it was a last minute phone call my girlfriend started crying and I was like what's wrong she was like Birmingham need to see Rue straight away and I was like right so she was like when are they, when he's flying out and she was like Sunday and I was like they were like pack your bags for a long time we don't know how long you're going to be over there for and I was like I can't, I can't just like get up and go here I've got Cassie and I've got um you know my job to kind of worry about here so I'll uh you know I'll, I'll try and sort this out best way I can I'll be over ASAP you know so um you know she flew over it on Sunday and what we didn't know at this stage was that we were actually going for um, a multiple organ transplant assessment and we didn't know this we just thought we were going over for a liver problem and um we then got over i i what, the, what my routine then was flying out every thursday night and come back every sunday and going to work and that was my routine in birmingham and then back home birmingham back to work you know see cassie go to work back over and that's the way i was juggling things and uh my girlfriend dion she stayed over in birmingham they give her accommodation and things like that which was good you know she was covered that way but her head was also turned because she was, wasn't getting home for the whole time she was in birmingham you know um, so we were flying back and forth, and so I was flying back and forward, and she was staying over there. And then after two weeks, we found out that my daughter needed um a multiple organ donation, and I was sitting thinking, you know, how did we go from you know this positive, you know, narrative of being home before Christmas with very no very, very little to no TPN to now needing an organ donation? Well, see, just on that, you just said there um, a liver problem. So I'm assuming that was down till way the blood was coming through the nose mm -hmm. and everything else. So it was it yep. down to the liver then? Yeah. Is that so, what they had, they had found out? Yeah. So basically 
bruise time and neonatal. Because of the TPN, TPN can be very hard in the body without medication, but if you've got medication as well, if you think about your little premature baby that's just developing and you're being pumped full of antibiotics and TPN and medications and paracetamol or pain relief or whatever it is, everything you take during that stage is going to be processed by your liver. Your liver processes everything in your body, cleans out all the toxins, does everything. So everything was being filtered through that liver. So it was so hard in her liver at the stage, obviously premature, premature as well, that the doctors over in um, Birmingham, I love them, they were, they were class, they were two Indian fellows, they were great crack, you know. And uh, he'd said to me, premature children who take TPN are, are mostly, you know, sorry, commonly okay. You know, they'll come off the TPN, they're going to be fine. But in Rue's condition, it was just battering her liver so hard that it scarred the liver. And because it scarred the liver, it then created a symptom called portal hypertension. So the portal, I think it's the portal venous vein or something that pumps blood through the liver. Um, what was happening was it was trying to reach the liver and then the liver was then pushing it back. So then when it was pushing it back, it was then coming out her stomach, coming out her nose, out her mouth. The blood was trying to find a way of escaping. That blood was just trying to find a way of escaping. So this is where then, when we were over in Birmingham, this is where my child made history. So there was one child before Rue, that was one years old that had to go through a procedure. And we were in the um, you know, the ward before the the you know, the operation. And they we asked them, you know, has this been successful? And he says, There's only ever been one child one years old and it wasn't successful. So and we were, you know, panicking, thinking, fuck, you know, this child's gonna die in surgery. Sorry. And um we uh basically uh were just kinda like up the high dough, you know. I remember for five or six hours, like I was sitting praying, and there's like a chapel on the middle floor. <laughs> I was sitting praying, you know, just thinking, you know, thinking, please, 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 please be okay, you know, make it through, you know, when I was here. And she did, which was everyone was over the moon, you know. It was meant to be what's called a a tips procedure, where they would put like a stent in the vein and redirect the blood flow from this side of the vein over to the other side. But they couldn't get it, so they did what was called a dips procedure, which was direct, I think it meant direct, something, you know. And that then meant that she could then really, it would take away the portal hypertension, which was start bleeding. One of the times when we were in Birmingham, um, we had to fly over home on the Wednesday. Um, I think my girlfriend had to, you know, um, sign a document or something. She had something going on or something, I can't remember what it was, but she had to go home and sign it. She had just, I couldn't sign it or couldn't get posted over whatever was going on, I can't even remember, but she flew over on the Wednesday. And we got a phone call on the Wednesday from the, the hospital saying, Rue's in a really bad condition here. And we were like, right, well, we'll be back over tomorrow straight away, you know, we've got to we'll go over and see her. And when we landed, um, again, this is another dark time. You know the way when you go to the hospital or you go to doctors, you see like the... Uh, big bowls, like the big, like, you know, you have like a kidney bowl, it's like a wee kind of cardboard kidney bowl with the big deep ones. There was three of them stacked up. Every single cloth was wet, soaking with blood. Three of them stacked up. What happened was that Rue was bleeding out so much that they thought she was going to bleed out that night and die. But they managed to get doctors and nurses on the scene from ICU to administer adrenaline. Adrenaline, when you put it under cloth and put it under the wound, it helps a clotting factor. And what happens is that when the liver gets so bad, your clotting factors start to go up which means it's bad. So if me and you cut ourselves, our liver clots that. But Rue was getting to the stage when she cut herself, earning happened, she was bleeding out, and it was getting really bad. So they're ministering drugs and all, and adding more blood, pints of blood to keep her going. And they uh, kept her going that night, and she didn't have to go to ICU, thankfully. And then she did pretty well then on the Friday. And then that Monday was when she then went for her operation. So that operation then saved her you know, from bleeding out. So if she hadn't got that operation, she would have died from portal hypertension, basically. She would have bled out and died. So we were very thankful that we were still in Birmingham at the stage because Birmingham didn't want to fly us back to Belfast because, you know, we would have we wouldn't have the capabilities in Belfast to be able to do that. So we then, you know, had to stay in Birmingham that long time to try and get that. And the reason why we were in Birmingham for so long was because they needed two surgeons that were you need two surgeons at the same time to do the same work. You couldn't do it with one surgeon, it had to be, and obviously they were booked up doing loads of operations and he was booked up or whatever it was and they had to come together to do that one job. So we were stuck in Birmingham for so long. And while we were stuck in Birmingham, um, this is this is one of the lessons I learned as well, how kind people were. Um, we were over there for, I think it was seven weeks, 
But at the time, we didn't know. We thought it was only going to be two weeks, you know. We just thought we were going to fly over and come back. So our life, the whole time in hospital, was, um, you know, drive up to the hospital, back home. Drive up every day for eight months, right? And we had come to about, I think it was four and a half thousand pounds we'd spent in fuel just for driving in the car between ourselves because she was going off in her own time and then I was coming home from work and driving up my own personal car, you know, and we were just, it was about 300 each, you know, a month. It would be four and a half grand we'd spent in fuel. And then we were coming to the stage then where I was having to fly over every time, you know, to Birmingham. And I was sitting thinking, you know, like, what happens if my girlfriend's maternity runs out here? You know, she's going to have no money. She's going to be stuck in Birmingham. I don't know how long I'm going to be there. So I decided to take the social media and um, start a GoFundMe. And all I asked for was £5,000. That's all I asked for. I didn't ask for, I just thought to myself, if I can get back the money that we spent in the fuel, that can keep us going a few months here in Birmingham or, or a few weeks or whatever it is over, you know, just get back the money that we can to kind of help us, give us a bit of breathing space. And within 23 hours, we raised £5,000. And it didn't stop. I kept going all the way to £12,000. And that was just on GoFundMe. And then people, you know, locally heard about it. And they started doing fundraisers. And they had heard about our story about the organ transplant and the, and the conditions that the child had. And they generated money for us as well. So we had made back the money from travel, which is really kind of people, you know, just there were people I don't even know. There was some guy, actually I do know him because I found out who it was, it was a guy from Antrim, and he donated 500 pounds. You know, just, he'd only met me, like, you know, just getting to know me that, that same year, you know, and he donated 500 pounds. And there's people from America were donating 200 pounds and all, and it was actually mad. And people were just, you know, emailing, you know, me on the GoFundMe saying, you know, hope you're okay, you know, let us know, keep us updated. And, um, you know, it was just the generosity of people that to come forward, you know, just to help us was amazing. It's just uh, like so so many strangers just don't need money, they don't even know. And um, we were able to then give us breathing space while we were in Birmingham. And um, that helped us a lot, you know, because we were just set up an absolute fortune. So when we got to Birmingham then, um, after the operation, um, after the portal hypertension operation, um, the doctor pulled us aside and he said... Uh, you know, it's time for end of life care. It's kind of like, you know, time to make your plan for end of life care here because we haven't seen an organ donation for that type of multiple organ donation. So she needed, I haven't went on the subject yet, she needed a small intestine, a pancreas, a liver, and a colon. And in order for that child of that weight and that size, now she was only eight months old, she would have been about maybe eight to nine kilos. You need a child that's going to be 21 kilos to come along and provide those organs for that size of that child because they need to trim down the organs to fit or if it's too big they need to take a bit off and restitch it and stuff and there's so many this is where I was talking about before the podcast was that this can touch into the same subject as Dahi's Law so in Dahi's Law now we have the um, opt-out scheme where if any of us pass away now they can just take our organs which I agree with I don't I don't care about mine I'm gone you can take mine you know whatever but if you have um you have excluded groups, and excluded groups mean people who don't have the mental capacity to understand what's going on, and children under the age of 18. So anyone under the age of 18 has to be given permission by their parents or their guardians to, you know, give, you know, organs over. So when we were in Birmingham and we were talking about the organ donation, we were asking, you know, you know, what was the likelihood of this happening? And they kept reaffirming. They were, they were very, very, very honest in Birmingham. They were just straight down the line. They were like, we haven't seen one of these in, in, in two years. The chances of you getting an organ donation is going to be very, 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 you know, hard. And for me, that then was the period where then I started to think to myself, you know, my fear is going to set in here. Not my fear, but my anxiety and intrusive thoughts. You had a guest on Paul McCarroll that talked about intrusive thoughts. So I suffered with OCD and intrusive thoughts when I was younger, and I had to go get CBT for it to get help. And it really did help me because, as, he, as Paul talked about, Paul talked about, you know, like tuning into the radio, the station that comes through, you can just tune into it. You know, so I was having all these thoughts, you know, she's going to die. She's not going to make it. You know, what, what are we going to do? How am I going to survive with my child? And I was having all these intrusive thoughts. And, you know, that started to kind of plague my mind when we were flying back over. And I remember she had become so unwell in Birmingham that we had a meeting with the doctors and the doctors had even said to me, you know, you know, do you, you know, DNR, you know, like, you know, I just said no. I just said if we if we pass away in the plane over here back to back to home, I don't want to you know do not resuscitate. I just don't want it to happen. I said there's no point in bringing her back if she's going to pass away. And the mother was kind of you know reluctant to that. She was like you know you know that's you know something that I want. And I was like Dion, the child's 
the, the, the chances here are, you know, we have to be realistic, you know. And um, we got back to Belfast and stuff. And, um, you know, obviously everyone knew then. So that in your end-of-life care, you can choose your options. You can have any options you want. You can go to a hospice, you can go home, you can do whatever you want. But we felt personally that the child should stay in the ward that she stayed most of her time with. She had all her friends and all her family there. That was her family. So we felt like, you know, go back to home and the ICU and then into the ward that she should be in. So end of life care comes and um, it's kind of, you know, a bittersweet, if that makes sense. You know, you just know your child's passing away and you feel so you feel so vulnerable because you can't do anything. You know, if you're, you know yourself, if you're a parent, that everything you try to do, you try to um, focus and protect that person. That's your job. That's your natural job. And see when you see when you know that that is being taken away from you, it's tough, you know, it's very 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 tough. And um, I remember thinking to myself, you know, you always hear parents saying, "If my child passed away, I jump in the ground after them," you know that way. And I started thinking to myself the same thing. I started thinking like, how how am I going to cope? How am I how am I going to cope? You know, losing this child. And we had a very, as I was saying, you know, the clotting factors earlier on. There's periods when the when the liver can feel so much that your child can bleed out. And I mean, like, your child can bleed out through its eyes or its nose or its mouth if your clotting factors aren't working. So we didn't want that for Rue. We wanted her to have a peaceful, you know, passing. So we then met with the consultants and they were like, she's getting to the stage now where factors are through the roof and... You know, her levels are through the roof, her Bella Rubens through the roof, you know, and she was very, 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 very yellow. She was almost, she was nearly as yellow as that bear. <laughs> That's how yellow she was, you know. And um, you kind of, you know yourself, you have to give it peaceful, peaceful passing. Like, so, you know, the syringe driver, the way they put on the side of the leg and the ministers of drugs, they administered that there. And I remember they'd walked in and um, they'd taken off her proviac line. So she had a Brovec line, sorry, she had a Bro- Brovec line just before she'd went into her ward. She, was, she had got an operation just in the neonatal, I forgot to mention that. So they'd finally got a Brovec line in instead of having their lines into the hands and into the head. And um, I remember they came in and they unplugged it. And it just felt like, you know, like our lifeline being turned off. I just remember just, you know, just like going into like deep tears and breathing really heavily and just like, just so much anger because we had such a positive outlook that she was going to get home. And then it turned and twisted into a really negative outcome in the space of literally like three weeks. You know, we were told she needs a multiple organ donation. You know, she's going to pass away here. She doesn't get it. And we were like, the whole narrative just changed. And um, I remember they said to us, we expect her to pass away, you know, within um, 20 minutes to half an hour, maybe 10 hour. And she lived from half seven, sorry, half eight, on the 21st of September, all the way through to half seven on the 22nd of September, without any lifeline. She just fought the whole way through it. And that's, to me, when I remember, like, holding her, my mother, she passed away, she looked up. And I remember she looked up, and she, like, looked, like, one big last look at my mum, or sorry, her mother. And I remember thinking, you know, that's your, this is my defining moment to kind of realise how strong you are and what your lesson is to me as a father. Even though I'm holding you, and you're passing away in my arms. You know, your defining moment for me right now is to teach me how strong I am, you know, because you show me how strong you are. And that's the lesson for me that I have tried to promote through this whole situation is that in your darkest and deepest days, no, no matter how, you know, dark it is, you look, you're all right. You're going to make me cry. <laughs> you know, it, it's, it's, it's sad because we're, we're both parents. Yeah. And uh, I can't imagine it. Can't imagine it. <laughs> Sorry. We're supposed to be you're ma- you're talking to you. <laughs> <laughs> We're supposed to be talking to, to you. Yeah. No, it's grand. And, and, and that's the thing was that... But we're three fathers. Yeah. Well, you know, I can't imagine, like, even going through that whole journey with your wee girl, you know, Rui, like, um, all them... All them stumbling blocks that you come to, and at every at every stumbling block you come to, it was like, right, we've passed that. Yeah, we've passed that. We've passed that. And then to say that 
and she did. She seen, she sounds like such a wee fighter. Yeah, you know, throughout the whole thing, mm-hmm. and even you and your you and your girlfriend as well to be so strong through that as well. Um, but it it's, it just hits home. It just hits home. You know, it's <clears throat> it's your wee girl. Exactly. I yeah. can't. I'm like, I, and I can't. I have two kids. Moan. Own as two boys. It's, I think it's just any any parent's worst nightmare, mm-hmm. and you can't imagine losing a child. So I'm sorry for getting emotional. It's, it's, oh no, it's no, you're grand. But obviously, that's uh, it, it, this is this is not the way. <laughs> this is not the way this is supposed to be. But it is, and I know with your story and and how you've been and how strong you've both been, but how strong she was mm-hmm. is amazing. And it as it's as beautiful as it is tragic, you know. When we're talking about that, you know, isn't it funny how the wee innocence of the learn the strength that they have and mm-hmm. the things that she come through. She survived an operation that nobody else survived. Mm-hmm. She's had so many operations. A wee life just, you know, with all the journeys and fighting on and your wife taking a stroke on it. It's just, it's not funny how strong and innocent and how much they bring to you. But it's just, it is, it's brutal. And, and it's all, <laughs> this is not, the way we're supposed to be home. <laughs> You, but it, it, I'm glad I made you cry. <laughs> <laughs> that was, that it, was the mission. <laughs> but it is, and for anyone listening, look, we we've always said it. We've always said that the greatest pain we hear is the loss of of a child. It's not natural. You, yeah. You know, your children are supposed to bury you. That's just the way the mm-hmm. world's supposed to be, and it's not always that. But as you're going through that, and your partner, and you're trying to support that. What way was your world then? Like, what way? And I know that's a stupid question, but I mean, where were you at then? When, when it was, um, it was very hard. You know, it was, um, I was just saying, I was so positive throughout the outcome. You know, I was the narrative was so positive. So we were always so, so, so positive. And then within that, there one month when we got the news that she was going to have the multiple organ donation, that's when everything changed for me. And I remember I was so angry and so frustrated. And when I met the consultants before we went into the into the children's ward and they were all telling us that narrative, I remember they all walked in and we were in ICU and this is when we come home from Birmingham and all the consultants walked in. And I was so, so, so angry. Like, I mean, I was, I was so angry. And I remember the consultant tapped me on the shoulder and saying, Dad, you know, we know that you're very angry here. And I just didn't, I didn't even look at her. And this is at that moment in time but in the end, you know, again, I felt compassion towards her and I felt sorry for the consultant because she um, is only human. We all are. And I remember thinking to myself, you know, um, like I remember saying, you told me this and you told me that and you told me we're going to be home by Christmas and we were aiming for Christmas and why is my child like this? Why is my child like that? And, you know, and what they basically told us was that um, some children just can't tolerate the feeds and can't tolerate obviously the medication as well it had just broken her down so I remember you know thinking you know like why did you tell me that narrative why couldn't you not have just told me I, I remember sending the consultant you know a positive negative positive approach is what I think you should tell parents in situations like this but I understand that the training that doctors are given is this one positive narrative because you go with the most Sorry, the main narrative, you know, they go the most common, you know, sorry, you know, sorry, the most, that's the most, most common, sorry, <laughs> you go with the most common narrative. And, um, you know, like, um, that's what they're trained to do. And that's, in my opinion, that is the right thing to do because you're, you know, you're, you're teaching the parents to be positive. But there was always that wee part of me that always said, you know, have the positive, negative, positive approach. Tell the parent, you know, positive outcome that you're focusing on tell them what can happen but we're not going to focus on that but we're going to focus on this and that was my attitude that was my my theory you know when i was i had a mixture of emotions I, I, you know the stress was there always when you were going up and down to the hospital every day you you, you had no life even when i tried to see my other daughter cassie i had no life with her because my time was so limited with rue but the really frustrating thing was that we had like six or seven months of this positive outcome in our minds and then the last month was just like boom dead you know and we tried to see the child as much as we could over and over and over and over and over again when she was in the hospital 
and your whole whole your whole life was on hold. You were so stressed because your whole life was overtaken by this dark place, which was hospital. You know, you're walking in, you're seeing these kids that are, you know, so sick in front of you, and it was very, 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 very hard. And this is where I go back to what Paul was saying. Uh, you know, your previous guest was that you were having all these dark, intrusive thoughts, and you were thinking. Fuck, I'm going into hell today again. I can't be arsed going here, you know. You know, I can't be arsed going into this hospital. You know, I can't be arsed going in to see these, in this really dark, depressing place. But then you had to also counterbalance that with, well, at least I'm getting to see my daughter. You know, at least I'm getting to see her and hold her and see her. And um, you were having a lot of darkness throughout your time. But that's where you then learn to, for you know, CBT, you know, you can learn to like tune into that radio station or let it go. You know, and that's what I was dealing with a lot. And I felt like, and I do feel like that a lot of things you go through in your life, um, whatever situation you go through in your life, it's like a building block. Because to me now, personally, not saying that, you know, I'm the strongest mentality in the world, but for me, I don't think there's anything in my life that can compare to losing my daughter. So that's like a, that's a, that's a place now for me, which is a positive thing because there's nothing like if I, if I lose my job tomorrow, that's not going to beat me up compared to what I've had here. Yeah. You know, if I lose my mother... I don't feel it's going to be as hard as losing my daughter. You know, your daughter is your daughter. It's your child. It's your it's your person. It's you. You know, and I think that you know that's the positive message I try to say is that you, as yourselves, you you now understand. You know, you you're, you're you're emotional about it. But if you have to face that, which I hope you don't, I pray you don't. But if you have to face that, it's from the outside looking in. When you're on the outside. You're looking in, you're thinking, I can do that. But then you get there, you have to. And that's it. That's the strength that you learn from it. You know, that's the that's the that's the thing I learned from it mostly. It it haunts you the the hope that they give you. I do feel that they give you false hope. But can I ask you, you you're a very logical guy. Does does your partner share the same anger towards the fact that th- you were told that this is is she the same it, it haunts her that you would give that positive and then and you weren't told the full picture of, of what could happen. Is is that more you or is that No, is she she was um she's uh still very angry, you know. Yeah. She has a lot of anger towards the, the whole situation. And under understandable, you know, that's I understand her opinion and, and, and her feelings towards that. Um you know and there's a lot of things for me that I look at and I see, well, that could have been done better, that could have been done better, that could have been done better, that could have been done better. But I also, again, I keep going back to the human aspect. We are all human and we all make mistakes. But there is periods where I felt, you know, things could have been dealt better. There was times when we could have been told stuff that weren't told. There was times where we felt like the child could have been looked at I looked at more thoroughly when she was in the ward back home. And then she had to be sent away to another country to find out what was going on. There's a lot of things and aspects that we could have focused on more back home or we felt you know angry towards those situations because they weren't 100 percent, you know fully given to us do you feel that if there had been things done differently the, the outcome would have been different i asked this question in the end and i asked the uh, one of the, the the guys over in birmingham and i sat and i for ages thought to myself you know if we'd figured out this problem with our liver could we have got the Birmingham sooner? Could we have got on the transplant list sooner? Could we have got could we have got that window to get the transplant? And the answers were no, because a child at a certain age can't take a transplant. So Rue was about six or seven months when we got over to England. So she was there, say th- third or fourth month. She was too small to take a transplant, even if there was a transplant waiting. And secondly, was that they hadn't seen that type of transplant, that multiple transplant come forward with children, again, because of the amount of parents that don't really put their children forward to give don- donations that way. So they hadn't seen a, a multiple organ donation in a long, long time. So she w- in, in the time frame that Rue was in Birmingham, there wasn't, there wasn't a donation a year before that. And there still, I don't think, has been. You know, So we were in the middle of that. So she would never have got the donations in time. At the time when we were in Birmingham, I was that much of... I'd said to them, you know, like, I'll give my, I'll give half my liver here to this child to save her, you know, and that was one of the things that I presented to them, but they wouldn't take my liver because it was a multiple organ donation, and what that means is that if they'd taken half my liver and it was successful, and she would have hurt, if you take, if you are successful in a multiple organ donation or 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 any organ donation, 
your body will then fight against the foreign object. So say, for example, she accepted my liver, right? She would then have to take an intestine or a small colon, or sorry, a colon or a pancreas from another child. And then that would be another issue where she might not be able to accept it. It had to be one donor. It had to be one donor. Because, the, and, and still a multiple donor being successful, it's not a guarantee either. Yeah. The body can reject it. Is there any ease in that? Knowing that, that, that you know, there could have been things done to ease her? Um, for me, yes. Um, you know, I just think that we were very, 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 very unlucky. You know, because you hear there was actually a child in our ward that we, we know of in the Balmain area that had the same condition as Rue. And she's now running around one year, one and a half years old, you know, living normal life. She had the same exact condition, but she didn't lose any of her, um, you know, they intestines. Weren't damaged. Yeah, they yeah. weren't damaged. She was completely fine. So when you weigh out the options of what happened and what we got to, and you look at it all and you, you get to the place where we got to, there was still no answer first, you know, there was no donation to come forward and it was still very hard to process that. You touched on the highest law mm-hmm. and I didn't know this. I am of the same mindset as you. If something happens to me now, Jesus, I give my organs a hard run so maybe they're no good to anybody but it wouldn't <laughs> worry me. But also, I'm thinking as a father, I don't want even like to say these words. If something happened to one of my boys, I don't know what I would do. I don't care if it's me, but then seeing what it could do for someone like you, mm-hmm. listening to this gives me a serious complex now. And I, I'm trying to be honest because I just don't know. My and I said, my beauty, I don't know if I'd want to. Mm-hmm. But there's a part of me now listening to this and people will be listening to this and they're now going to have to have that conversation with their partner and say, it's not a conversation anybody ever wants to have, but knowing what that could mean and that could be their legacy, it's given me a real moral complex because I've never thought of that. I've always been a very strong advocate for donation because I'd just be like, you're not here. Yeah. But I'm, I'm sort of, torn and and i don't know what i'll do and that's me being honest and sitting being honest with you now and I, I completely sympathize with you on that because for me if you know your your children are just your wee you know and like god forbid something did happen to one of your children and in a car accident like say for example my daughter cassie was in a car accident i feel now personally because i went through it i would say to cassie's mother you know we could help another child because Cassie's passed away, you know, and we could help another child. But at the same time, I would completely understand if the mother turned around and said no. And I completely, 100% understand that with, with everything, you know, because it's a very, very hard thing to do to turn around and say, you know. But I wasn't aware that, that children weren't, and I can understand now, because you might be angry that, and I can understand that. I just I wasn't aware, and it's something, we, we're very much, we bury our head in the sand, we never want to think of the bad things, but we know it happens and we hope it never happens to us and that's the way life is, you hope things never happen to you and it does and it comes knocking on your door. But that has given me a lot of thought and like the legacy could be another beautiful wee child, mm-hmm. you know, so a lot of parents are going to be sitting now mm-hmm. having that, listening to this, having that, you know, but the other side of the thing I want to talk on, the false hope and I can't begin till 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 comprehend that because I'm slightly different and you're a very logical thinker. I'm quite actually a very logical thinker, but sometimes in in for me, I'd nearly want false hope if if the outcome wasn't. And I know that might be uh, maybe in the ignorance of it that I would want them to make me hopeful because I'm a negative sort of person. Yeah. Sometimes yeah. I, I, you're quite a positive you are a very positive person and we've seen that from me and how your mindset was and you're very robust and you were being positive and 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 i think that's one of the things that i feel that hurt you that that it wasn't full disclosure and you didn't get that or with me when i'm thinking about that i don't know what i'd want but i want them to tell me that because i'm quite a negative person and i'd rather they give me the light but in the end, I would have the same questions yeah. and the anger and it's displacement. You don't know, and especially for your partner, like, uh, you know, I know what we say, right? We say this, it's our children. 
but there's something in a mother carrying a child too there's that real like you know bond a mother's yeah. bond mm -hmm. So like the, the anger she must have on everything. Like yeah. why my wee baby? Like it it it's incredibly sad and and obviously it, it, we're getting comforted by you, which is actually very embarrassing. <laughs> um, but it is incredible. There are just so many things. But what uh, overwhelmingly the whole way through that story, I was just thinking, what a wee fighter. Mm -hmm. Three children struck down with that, and I, I had a question about that too. And in such a an uh. A contained environment where everyone's being careful. How did three? Is it an airborne one? Or? So this is the thing that um, I was trying to research as well. Was that apparently that their type of um, infection is, is is contracted from person to person. So it's person to person contact. So what I I don't know. That's I can't medical. You're yeah, not touching someone yeah, else's child. I can't say you know this is what happened. Uh, I have to be very careful in what I say as well because I'm not ever going to turn around and say you know it's your fault. You've done this. You know and that, that, that's not my attitude. Um, there must have been there must have been someone who who had it before or during when we were there, and it must have got passed and they didn't know. That's all I can say. That's all I can think about. That's my opinion. I don't know if it's right or wrong. And I think what happened maybe they're working with someone and then passed on to another thing or you know I don't and, really know. And then poor other parents mm -hmm. had the, the the same heartache and and, and that you have. What what way what's what's Rue's legacy now to use to what, me. To me, Rue's legacy is the lesson that she taught me. That, she, that will never leave me. So I watched that little girl go through challenge after challenge after challenge after challenge and all she did was smile. She just didn't, she just didn't, she, she cried a bit, but she always smiled. Do you know what I mean? And for me, that taught me how strong, because when we had our funeral, I did a speech and I talked about how Rue's physical form was an internal form for me and her mother for us to remember. So she was a part of us. And Rue's lesson to us was to show us how strong we are. So that's our legacy towards me, is to teach me how strong I am, right? And in a weird way, I try to challenge myself more. You know, I try to try to challenge myself to do things that, you know, I don't want to do. But I force myself to do it because she had to go through things that she didn't want to do. And she smiled the whole way through it, you know, that way. So she she just, she didn't want to be stabbing needles. She didn't want to go for an operation. She didn't want to be born the way she was. She didn't want to have to live off TPA and be eating her fingers, starving all the time. But she did it with a smile. So I challenge myself often now in different, you know, situations and scenarios. Um, like I try to go to the gym every day. I try to, you know, um, to challenge myself, you know, to just even though I don't want to go, I just go, you know, and I try to, you know, there's, there's things I take on now in work that I never used to because to me they're a piece of piss now compared to what I've been through in the past. That doesn't bother me or worry me at all in the slightest. If you throw me into a system, I don't know I'm going to figure it out because that's easy compared to losing my daughter. And that's her legacy towards me. You know, that's that's the thing she's taught me. That's her legacy in my eyes. If you can come through that, you can come through anything. That's my attitude for me personally. You know, I'm not sitting saying that my situation is the hardest thing in the world because there's so many people out there that have been through so much more um, heartbreaking and, and, and tough scenarios. But I think my message from that situation about my child is something that we all worry about as parents. It's a very common worry about what happens to your child if you lost your child. And what I try to teach people through that momentum of it is that um, you can still survive. You can still live without your child. It's fucking shit. It really is tough, like, but you can do it and it is manageable. And don't get me wrong, you suffer every day, but there's strength in the suffering, you know. And for any parent that is maybe going through that situation right now in hospital with their child that might be unwell or, you know, a, a person who's lost their father, you know, there's, you will, there is a strength there. You have to do it. You just have to turn up and you can get through it. And you can still live a, a reasonably ha happy life because my daughter, even though she's gone, she will always be Cassie's little sister and she'll always be my next child's big sister. You know, so she always lives on. See, just around the organ donation, is there anything that you would like to put out there around organ donation? Like the likes of parents just even have a conversation around that. Is that would that be a driving force as well, just for people to actually start talking about that? It's a hard decision for parents to make on their child, but I'm glad you come on and it's it's now in my head. Yeah. That is maybe a conversation that me and my wife could have, hoping it never happens. But is that something you'd like to Get out there as well. I think, yeah, I think, again, we touched on Dahi's Law, which was a lot of change. You know, that little boy needs a new heart and he's still been waiting, but he's an excluded group because he's under the age of 18. And I think, you know, from personal experience from losing a child, I think it is something that now has changed me. And as if you said, you should now open your mind to it. 
So I think that if anyone's listening to it and their parents are listening to it, it is such a very grey area within this country and within the NHS to give organs to children. And it is a really, really grey area that needs to be kind of a spotlight more put on, you know, that way. Um, you know, it's... it's See the amount of children that I've I've seen over in, in England and like the liver unit, the amount of children that need transplants and they're waiting 14, 15, maybe 16 months, maybe sometimes two years and the work they have to go through to try and get a liver. Just even one organ can take nearly two years. And that and their and their body is decreasing and decreasing and decreasing and decreasing, you know, while they're waiting. And then that's very, very, very sad for those parents as well that are going are struggling through that position. So, you know, something that can be opened up. Mm-hmm. Well, Julian <coughs> you know, obviously, Dion, and you have that shared loss that you only you two can understand with each other. But also, it's bound to put a serious pressure on a relationship, or has it united you? Because grief's very personal, and this is one thing that we have said to people how you grieve and how your partner grieves. And you know, is completely different, and sometimes it, it it angers. We we see couples can't can't cope with it because one may be having a better day than someone's worst day, and then it, it, it annoys you about them because why are they not grieving the same? But grief's completely different, and that and, and it's different for each person. It doesn't mean they love or, or or they've lost any less. But how was it on the relationship? It, it was it was good. That's a good question. It was hard. It was, it was very hard. Um, obviously, we're very sad and upset. With that situation, and then we're taking it out in each other, and we're arguing and arguing and arguing. But we have like this unbreakable love between ourselves. Like we could argue and argue and argue about something so stupid, but we're just so strong together, and we're just be back together that night. But she understood that she was grieving, and I understood that she was grieving, and she understood, you know, and I understood I was grieving, and I knew that you're stressed and you're upset, and you're you're all these different emotions that are all coming out within the relationship. And it's like you know yourself, you have a stressful day at work, you know, and you've, you've had a shit day, and you come home. And you're like, fuck, see that, you know, that boy's done my head in, or that job, that idiot. And you're bad mood and you're snappy with your partner. You know, that's the same, that's, that's multiplied like a million times when you lose a child, you know. So we were very, 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 very like um, argumentative with each other, but we knew what, why we were arguing, you know, and, that, and we worked through that there. And, and now we've got to, she passed away in September there. So we're now, you know, maybe what's that? How many months? Six, six months? Four or five yeah, months? Yeah. On, you know, and um, we're a lot stronger now than what we were, say, six months yeah. ago. And like, and and that's and that's that is what I want to ask. But there was one thing you covered, and, and I'm glad you did, and you were very very honest in 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 covering it. There, all the turmoil and all the the emotions, but there's a very practical side till when a child's ill and in hospital, that. You have your job and, and, and the other things, Cassie's still there and the needs, your your house to cover your payments and stuff. Mm-hmm. There's still that need that, yeah, like some people will be like, oh, I need to go and, and think that that would be in an ideal world. You could go and you're there full time and you could be there with the aunt and you can support each other. But the practical side must have put a serious toil on it where she's in a room on her own and you're on a room on your own, but you're back here working mm-hmm. and you aren't with it. It's bound to be very, very hard, that, you know, the practical side of that and the financial side of it, you, you said, and people in this country are unbelievable and, and further afield, mm-hmm. but it's nice when it's a child. You yeah. know, the compassion that people have that there, that they were fit to help, and, and it's only a small, it's just lifted one other pressure. But there's a very practical side till, as you said, you were here, and your wife's you're trying not to wipe your partner um, and not put more pressure on you but <laughs> a stroke and then we sort of roll past that because the, the, the th- but a stroke in the middle of it mm-hmm. just the sheer amount of stress like it must have been just hell at that point running about and and, and not knowing you know you're running from one thing it's one fire to the next fire yeah. so it was it was it was um Again, I'm so thankful that I had uh, a few issues in the past that taught me how to use my uh, bit of wood up there a bit better, like, um, you know, and I was under a amount, massive amount of stress. So what I would do in my routine would be, you know, wake up in the morning, go to work, go to the gym at lunchtime, go see the child. And then the gym was, the gym, or I had to take some time off work. It wasn't very long, but when, when Rue was in Belfast and um, 
my partner was in the other hospital. I was then having to go and see Dion while I was off, and then go see Rue, and then come home. And I was juggling those three, and then trying to see Cassie as well. And it was it was it was very hard. It was it was very stressful. But again, it's about managing your stress and knowing there's a wee thought in the back of your mind that's saying this isn't going to be forever. Because again, I keep going back to Paul. Paul's um, podcast was very, um, what's the word? I'm thinking of was very uh, interesting for me because he always talks about, you know, it's hard, but it will get better. And that's my mindset. It was hard. It will get better. Nothing lasts forever. It doesn't. It can't. And even if it tries to, it just can't because the brain... There's so much stimulation, it can't handle that. It just goes back to its normal self. And for me, I knew that in the background. I was so stressed. I was going to see Dion, going to see Rue, come back, stress, 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 you know, and it just eventually, it's now, after the passing of Rue, things have settled, but you go into a different type of stress, and then that'll settle too, you know, and then you'll learn. And that's the best way I can describe it, is the amount of stress you're going through can never last forever. It can only last for a short time. If it takes a year, it takes a year, but it's still not going to be for the rest of your life, you know. Well, the perspective in life that Rue's brought for you, that if she if she can do all them things and smile, you know, the, the, the person annoying you, the, the, the things, the small things in, in what you've went through and your partner's went through, and I, Julian, I want to thank you. It, it definitely made me think a lot. I don't ever, I bury my head in the sand, I never want to think of bad things. It's a natural instinct as a parent, and and but hearing what you had to go through and, and having a conversation now, hopefully people are going to have that conversation. Say, sit down with each other and say, "Look, this isn't going to happen, but where's our mind?" Yeah, and maybe just put it in their thought and put it away in your thought. Or if anything ever have happened, you could have that conversation because it could just mean someone else's life saved so that's something very powerful and, and I don't know where I'm at on that and that's me just trying to be brutally honest but your outlook and your positivity and, and the resilience is unreal I hope I hope you just continue to talk to people and each other and, and hope Dion can work through the anger of it because I don't know whether I could ever I'll probably be angry for the, the rest of my life you know and, and, and that's just the type of person I am but I hope she can talk to people and, and, and get help. And I hope the legacy of Rue going through and showing you that and, and, and lighting up and that smile, you'll know, always remember the smile and and, and it helps and, and helps somebody here that's going through something similar that there that message that you will survive it, that if you can survive this, you survive anything. Yeah. But it's absolutely heartbreaking. And it, and it's breaking my heart to think about it, but I just want to thank you, the bottom heart, for coming up. No, you're grand, mate, and thanks for having me. Thank you very much, Lynn. All right, lads. Thank you. <laughs>